Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first GTAP webinar of 2024, featuring an article published in the latest volume of the Journal of, Economic, Glo Journal of Global Economic Analysis. Um, in this webinar, we have the luxury of having Dr. Eddie Beckers, who will present the paper, A Ricardian Structure in CGE, Modeling Eton Cortum based Trade with GTAP. I'm sure most of you know Eddie and are familiar with all the impressive work he has been doing and, and continue to do. Um, just as a background, Eddie is a counselor at the Economic Research and Statistics Division of the World Trade Organization, focusing on quantitative trade modeling. Eddie holds a PhD from Erasmus University Rotterdam and a master's in economics and econometrics from the University of Amsterdam. Prior to joining the WTO, Eddie was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bern and assistant professor at Johannes Kepler University in Linz. Eddie conducts research on a wide range of topics related to international trade, such as firm heterogeneity, gravity modeling, long-run projections, trade and climate change, trade traded goods, prices, FDI, and trade in services. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Eddie's work. He is well published and his research has been circulated in a number of peer-reviewed journals, such as the Economic Journal, European Economic Review, Canadian Journal of Economics, Review of International Economics, Economics Letters, and the World Economy. And Ed has also authored numerous WTO reports and, and publications. Um, before handing over um, the, the meeting or the webinar to Eddie, I would like to remind everyone to please mute your microphone. Um, please do not interrupt Eddie during his presentation. We will have discussions following his 30 to 40 minute presentation. If you have questions or comments, please type them into the chat box or raise your virtual hand during the discussion by clicking on reactions, raise hand in the meeting control panel. I will monitor the questions, comments posted in the chat room and will relay them um, to Eddie during the discussion. Um, just a reminder, this seminar will be recorded and posted on our website and social media with, with the presentation file. So without further ado, um, I now turn the floor over to Eddie um, for this first webinar of 2024. Eddie? Thanks, Erwin. Uh, it always feels a bit uncomfortable, um, this introduction. Uh, so let me start right away with the with the presentation. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So um, I'm going to try to tell something about this uh, this paper that was published in December in the JGEA, um, basically on a Ricardian structure in, in CGE. And so this work builds on earlier work that we uh, that we did for a, a paper on uh, the Northern Sea Route, uh, where we analyze the potential impact of opening the Northern Sea Route to international trade, and where we actually introduced uh, into, uh, into the GTAP model, we introduced a, a different structure for international trade. And so now in the paper in the JGEA, we have um, neatly documented how, how that was done. But before I get there, let me first um, provide some background. So as you all know, uh, in CG models, we usually work with Armington unless we have uh, Ethia Krugman or Mallet's type of versions, but especially the long run projections, they all run on, on Armington. Uh, and Ar the Armington structure is one of the reasons why CG models have been criticized. And we have this in famous quote by Caliendo from Caliendo and Paro, or there is, I, I typed this wrong here. It wasn't published in Restat, but in Restat. But basically, they were saying that these models have been criticized for their complexity, lack of transparency and analytical foundations, and the arbitrary choice of the value of key parameters. And so here, what is mostly concerned is the analytical foundations, where Armington was argued to be somewhat, somewhat unrealistic. Yeah, because consumers, they don't decide based on, on where goods are coming from, but they 
uh, if if it is at all product differentiation, it's more based on on product differentiation by uh, by firms or by product type. Yeah, Eaton and Cortum don't go this route with with a product differentiation a la a la, a la Krugman, for example, but they actually introduce a comparative advantage in a setting where we have multiple products in multiple countries. And the way they get distractible is by uh, using a, a probabilistic formulation for productivity. And so there is a, an earlier paper by Arcolakis Cosono Rodriguez Clare in the AER, who show that subject to a set of macro restrictions, actually Eaton Cortum and Armington uh, lead to the same reduced form equations for international trades. Or more concretely, they generate uh, equivalent expressions for demand and for the price index. Yeah, the thing is that um, if we write the model in quantities, as we tend to do in, in CGE and not in values, as the new quantitative trade models do, um, then we could we could see differences between uh, between the Armington and the Ethia Krugman structure. And so that is what we will focus on also. Um, yeah, so let me uh, point out what I will discuss. So first, I will briefly give an overview of the differences between new quantitative trade models and CGE models, as also discussed in the paper. Then I will go into a, a brief exposition of the Eaton Cortum model. Um, then I will very briefly discuss the implementation in the in the GTAP model. I will not dwell so long on up, upon this because it's very much focused on how you implement this in in GEMPAC. Um, and then finally, I will discuss a comparison of the EK and Armington structure with a set of stylized counterfactual experiments. And these counterfactual experiments, they generate three main results. First of all, as expected, as per Arcolakis, Cosino, Rodriguez, Claire, the impact of trade policy experiments on real income is very similar. And so the only difference seems to be coming from the fact that we have a transportation sector in our model, which is absent in this ACR kind of comparison. Um, then secondly, we see that the impact of trade cost changes on the volume of trade is smaller in Eaton Cortum than in Armington. If the model is calibrated to the same, what is called trade elasticity, and this trade elasticity is the elasticity of the value of trade with respect to trade costs. And that is, uh, if you calibrate to the same elasticity of trade values with respect to trade costs, you're going to see that the impact of trade cost changes on volumes of trade are somewhat different between the two models. Yeah, but the differences are relatively small. Then third, we show that uh, although we would have expected that uh, terms of trade gains from raising tariffs would be larger in the Eaton Cortum model, because um, as I will explain later, you will be better able to drive down the prices of your trading partner from which you're importing. Um, we find that because of general equilibrium effects on the exporting side, it is not uniformly the case that the terms of trade gains from raising tariffs are larger in the in the EK model. Okay, so let me first go into this, um, into this background. Um, so, um, yeah, you could say about 20 years um, after the, um, I'm looking for my watch. Uh, yes, so about 20 years after the large scale implementation of, of CGE models, roughly then academic trade economists, they started working on new quantitative trade models, which uh, you could say come in, in two, different, uh, uh, two different shapes. So on the one end, we have the structural gravity models, which were inspired by Anderson von Winkoop, uh, employing an Armington structure, uh, but what they do different compared to CGE is that they calibrate their uh, their model to predicted trade values instead of actual trade values. On the other hand, we have the models applying exact head algebra, and this is inspired by the work of Eaton and Cortum with their different trade structure, as we will discuss later on. Um, and uh, what they do is they uh, also use so-called exact head algebra, um, to calculate counterfactuals. And this has become kind of the standard now in, um, in quantitative trades, in the new quantitative trade models. 
So let me then discuss five systematic differences that we, uh, we have identified between these two types of models. First, the scope of the model is somewhat different. Uh, and CG models are more extensive. They have more economic and institutional details, whereas the emphasis in new quantitative trait models is on, on having a compact and parsimonious uh, model. Um, and the reason to do so is that you're going to be able to explain well what is going on if you run counterfactual experiments. Yeah, because the idea is that you can write your model entirely in in exact hat algebra, so in ratios of um, new to old uh, to old uh, values after a counterfactual experiment, and therefore the argument is that you're better going to be able to explain what is going on. Um, secondly, there is a difference in terms of baseline calibration. As I already mentioned, structural gravity models, they calibrate baselines to predicted values, whereas CGE models and also NQT models, most NQT models that use exact that algebra, they calibrate to actual observed values. Uh, what is interesting is that the original Eaton Cortum model was calibrated as a structural gravity model. Yeah, but later on, uh, when when Eaton Cortum wrote this Deckley Eaton Cortum paper, then they shifted and they shifted towards calibrating to actual values. Then third, um, we see that there is a difference in thinking about uh, what you could call structural estimation, where the NQT models they um, think that structural estimation is very important. And the way we see structural estimation in in trade models is that it comes down to estimating all parameters of the model. Um, um, basically, um, you use, or I should phrase it differently, you use the same um, data set and the same model to estimate all the parameters and to run your counterfactual experiments. So that means that you're not taking parameters from the literature, but you estimate everything with one data set. So in our case, you would try to estimate everything with the, with the GTAP database. Um, CG models, instead, they are more flexible because they also tend to take parameters from the literature. And the typical argument is that uh, basically is external validity. You need to be in line with what has been done before. And if you estimate based on, on one specific database, it could be that you're getting actually uh, parameters that are kind of um, not in line with, with what we've seen before. Yeah? And that could lead to, uh, to funny results. Then the solution method, uh, this is more technical, not so important, but CG and levels and structural gravity, they solve a baseline equilibrium and a counterfactual in levels and then compare, whereas CG and relative changes, so that's what we do with GEMPACT and also exact and algebra, they calculate either percentage changes in multiple steps or ratios of counterfactual to baseline values. Then finally, there is a fifth difference, and that is that it's more methodological. That is that CGE follows, a, you could say, a built-on approach where we, um, we have an established database, yeah, and for example, GTAP, or it could be also EORA, for example, that uh, everybody uses. And um, basically, there is a consortium. Everybody uh, meets there every year. Uh, we talk with each other. And so we know how basically uh, databases have been built, how models have been built. Yeah, whereas in the NQT literature, it's more common to start completely from scratch with new, with new projects. Yeah, which um, uh, on the one hand, you could say is, is academically clean, but on the other hand, you also run the risk that you make mistakes in data collection and also in, in modeling. Okay, so... Um, let me skip then the more detailed discussions. I think I've already mentioned this, maybe on this one on structural estimation, I could say one thing. Um, uh, CG community is kind of convinced that you should use parameters from other studies for external validity reasons. Whereas NQT, the NQT community, they tend to refuse the use of parameters from other studies. And then they prefer to use Cobb Douglas Ness because it seems as if you don't have uh, you don't have any parameters. And I think here the nicest illustration of the differences in approaches is the paper 
the, the papers by Cosino, Donaldson and Smith and Guell and Laborde on the role of trade in climate change, uh, in, in uh, uh, coping with, uh, with climate change, so in, in climate change adaptation. Okay, so then let me turn to uh, Ethan Cortum. So the, um, you could say the original Ricardian model, the, the model proposed by David Ricardo had two countries, two goods and one factor of production. Yeah, and so Dornbus Fischer Samuelson extended this to multiple goods, a continuum of goods, but still two countries. Yeah, that's a model it used to be employed quite a bit also in international finance. Um, and then finally, Eton and Cortum extended this to multiple goods and multiple countries, yeah, which basically enables us to also bring this to the, to the data. Um, and so the way they do this is um, they have a probabilistic formulation for productivity where each country draws a productivity for each good on a continuum. Yeah, so basically, if you look at it from a sectoral perspective, as, as we do in our models, within each sector, you have a continuum of goods. And basically the cheapest country is supplying uh, each of the goods within, within that continuum. Um, if you solve the model, eventually you're gonna see that the model is characterized by three parameters. So we have a, a country state of technology, which is determining absolute advantage. Then we have the heterogeneity of product productivity, which is determining comparative advantage. So how much, how large is the difference in productivity between different countries? And finally, we have the geographic barriers, yeah, by which Eaton Cortum basically calibrate their model. Yeah, they don't use Armington shifters, but they calibrate basically in um, uh, when they use exact that algebra and they calibrate their model to actual shares, they use basically geographic barriers or iceberg trade costs to get a, a perfect fit between their, their baseline shares and the actual shares. Okay, so then a bit of math. Um, how does that work? We have N countries, we have a continuum of goods ranging from zero to one. Um, then we have... Um, uh, the efficiency of producing good J, uh, J is denoted by Z, uh, ZJ in country I. Um, then we have perfect competition, constant returns to scale. We have input costs CI. So that means that the cost of producing in country I is CI divided by the productivity uh, ZI. Then we could have geographic barriers. Here in the initial exposition, I follow the the, the convention that was introduced by Eaton Cortum and that many people, which many people in, in the NQT literature still follow, namely that trade costs from country I to N are denoted by D and I. Um, okay, so then if we follow that, we know that the landed price of a variety J produced in country I and sold in country N consists of three components, the, the, the unit cost, the productivity and the iceberg trade costs. Yeah, and so we have perfect competition. So therefore this is also the price that consumers pay. But now the thing is the complication becomes that, or actually also the beauty of the model is gonna be that consumers in a certain country, they're gonna buy the cheapest good. So you could say that there are no search costs. So basically they go straight for the, the cheapest good and then we get these order statistics. So that means that the price in uh, uh, buying country N for variety J is actually gonna be the minimum over uh, the potential prices from all the trading partners. I. Yeah, and then um, basically they combine this supply side structure with a, with a simple CES setup where the utility in, in uh, a country I is basically is a, is a is a CES over the continuum of varieties uh, uh, that, that you're consuming. Okay, so now we're gonna elaborate a bit on, on this price. Yeah, so now the, uh, the, the next step or the next trick is to assume that technology is stochastic. And that means that um, in a certain producing country I, the efficiency to produce good J is determined by a, um, um, is a realization of a random variable with a, with a distribution function f. Yeah, and so uh, because we have a continuum of goods, the law of large numbers dictates that 
uh, FIZ is also going to be the fraction of goods for which country I has an efficiency that is smaller than Z. Yeah, so basically you could focus on the individual variety J, or you could say, oh, actually, this is telling me something about the whole range of, of uh, the continuum of varieties. Then what distribution function do they use? They use a Frechette distribution function um, where basically we're going to see these two parameters. The TI is the, is the location of the distribution. So that is going to govern absolute advantage. So if you have a bigger TI, you're better um, as a country in producing, in generating high draws, so in producing uh, uh, more productively. And then theta is basically a measure for the variation of the efficiency distribution. So therefore, it's a measure for comparative advantage. Yeah, And so uh, you could kind of see that if um, theta is um, uh, if theta is very big, then um, uh, we're going to get less uh, variability. Yeah, because basically the probabilities for all Z's they become they get very close to each other. Yeah, because if you vary the Z, you're going to move very quickly over the productivity distribution. Yeah, that's basically. Let me first jump to this picture. Here you see a product. I did this in in very simply in Excel. Uh, so it's, you see the figure is not perfect, but this is more for illustration. But we see that if theta is small, we get a dispersed productivity distribution, where if, whereas if theta is big, and I display the year 8.28 because that's the, the estimate that Eaton Cortum use, uh, we see that the distribution is very squeezed. Uh, um, and so therefore, uh, different countries are very close to each other. So we see here also in this picture, the influence of absolute advantage. So the higher is your productivity, the further to the right is gonna be your productivity distribution. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I still have a bit of time because um, now the next step is uh, that we're gonna substitute, um, basically we're gonna try to derive uh, um, a distribution function um, for the, the landed price in, um, in country N. Yeah, for, um, exactly. Yeah, so basically this is the, the, the price distribution. Um, so maybe I should go back. Um, um, yeah, exactly. So basically what we do is we combine this expression for the price, we solve it for Z, then we can substitute it into this distribution function, um, then that means that we get a distribution actually not for productivity, but we get a distribution for the price. And so that is what we do here. We, here we get a distribution for the price of a good that is sold from country I to country N. But then actually what we're interested in is the price distribution in the country that is, that is basically consuming goods and they can consume from all their different trading partners. And uh, using order statistics, we can now define the, the, the distribution of prices, which is basically gonna be the lowest price distribution uh, in country N among all importers I. It can be calculated based on the fact that uh, the probability that the price is smaller than P in country N is equal to one minus the probability that all countries supply uh, at a price larger than P. Right? So you get this expression. Now you can substitute this into here, and then actually you get a, an expression for the, uh, the price, the price distribution in uh, a consuming country N. And so we see that the, uh, basically that's, it's not the price index yet because this is a distribution, but you already see that the price distribution is basically gonna be governed by this parameter theta n, and this theta n basically is a, is a summation over um, the absolute advantage and the, the cost of input bundles in each of your trading partners, where it is kind of scaled with the, with the, trade, with the trade costs with each of these trading partners. Yeah, and so uh, we see that I'm going to get a lower Basically, I get a, a lower price distribution or on average, I get lower prices if the state of technology in my trading partners is higher 
or the input costs are lower or the geographic barriers with my trading partners are lower. Yeah, and then you could have these two extremes. On the one hand, it is a zero gravity world without trade costs. The price would be the same in each of the trading partners, of course. On the other hand, under autarky, um, only your own technology is going to determine your own price distribution. Then we come to three more properties. And here I will not have enough time to go through the proofs. Uh, it's not terribly complicated, but it is, is, a, it is a bit tricky. Uh, the first property is that the probability that a country I is actually selling to country N um, is equal to uh, that country N's price uh, parameter. Yeah? So basically the probability that I import from country I is given by, you could say, the, the, uh, the, um, the determinants of the price from country I relative to the average price level. Yeah, you see here already that this is kind of very similar to what we have under Armington. Yeah, but now the thing is that it is derived from a model with comparative advantage. Secondly is um, a property that they need um, um, in the model, and it's a property that comes uh, from the from the or that is basically driven by the fact that we assume a for share distribution for for productivity, and that is that the price of a good that country N actually buys from any country I has the the has the same distribution. Yeah, so basically I have this distribution G and P for the landed price in the in the consuming country N. And basically, um, the, 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 the price distribution of goods that I buy from any of my trading partners is the same. What is the reason? The intuition is that if, uh, let me see if I, you know, I, time reasons I skipped that. So the intuition is um, that if, uh, say, one trading partner is more expensive than another trading partner, you would in principle say, okay, it's price distribution or the, the price distribution of the goods that I import from that country should be different and prices should be higher. The thing is, if a country is more expensive, there is going to be an extensive margin adjustment because I will import less varieties from that country because they will basically be supplied by another country. I remember that we had this competition where each variety that we buy, we buy it from the cheapest country. Yeah, and so if a country is more expensive, uh, because it has higher trade costs, for example, it means that we're going to buy less varieties from them. And which varieties do we not buy from them? It's their most expensive ones. Yeah, and so basically these two forces exactly cancel out and therefore the price distribution is uh, independent of the country of origin. Finally, we can define the price index and you see that this is going to give us something that is very similar to Armington. Yeah, so let me here give some uh, intuition for the uh, there is one more step here and that is that um, here I have the share that I import from country I and country N yeah but obviously I'm interested in the value or the quantity that I import from from country I and there we need the property two namely that the price of uh, uh, what I import from country I is uh, the same for all my my uh, uh, for all my trading partners I, yeah. So therefore, the share that I import from country I is actually also the value that I import uh, uh, is also the value share that I import from country I, yeah. And it is actually also going to be the quantity share that I import from country I. Uh, why is that? Because the price distribution is the same. Yeah, so basically if we use this, if we combine these two properties for the share that I, uh, the probability that I import from country I is given by this expression. If I uh, combine it with the second property, we can write the gravity equation, which gives me the value of trade from country I to country N. And we see that this is basically um, has the same structure as Armington. Yeah, so we see the price, um, this is the price index in, uh, in country uh, N to the power theta. Then we see the bilateral trade costs to the power minus theta. Then we have the 
the uh, expenditures in the uh, uh, importing country and we have the um, quantity uh, that is produced in the exporting country. And then here we have outward multilateral resistance, yeah, which is maybe not something that we always do in, in CGE, but basically this is the same as we have in, uh, in Armington. Um, what is different is the coefficient on trade costs, on iceberg trade costs, um, because we see that it is minus theta, whereas in Armington, it is minus sigma minus one. Yeah, and so the uh, intuition is somewhat different. Yeah, in Armington, a larger substitution elasticity means that you're more quickly going to substitute away from uh, French cars to German cars if these French cars are more expensive because you don't care so much about the, the, the country of origin. Whereas in the Eaton Corton model, the intuition for the trade elasticity is uh, somewhat different. Yeah, the argument is, uh, remember that theta was my dispersion, it, it governed the dispersion of my productivity distribution. Yeah, we saw here, if I have a high theta, productivities are all very close to each other. If I have a small theta, they're far away from each other. What happens now if all these uh, productivities are very close to each other? Um, if one country becomes more expensive because its trade costs go up, you're going to see that um, for a lot of varieties, uh, as an importer, you're going to jump to another uh, to another supplier, yeah, because the productivities are all very close to each other, yeah, and so that's why basically this theta, this uh, strength of comparative advantage, is also governing the uh, the the response of trade to changes in trade costs. Okay, so that um, brings me to. Uh, the implementation in the in the GTAP model. Um, first of all, uh, as I mentioned already, the original Eaton Corton model did not calibrate the baseline to actual values, but to fitted values. Uh, but later on, exact that algebra, they kind of changed. And so uh, we can, um, um, uh, basically we can follow our calibration as always with this Eaton Corton model where we just calibrate to actual values. Yeah, and so that means that we don't need, and this is oftentimes a point that is confusing uh, for, for some people. We don't, if we want to calibrate our CG model in principle, we don't need explicit technology parameters or iceberg trade costs. Yeah, I think if you're calibrating GAMS, what you typically do is you use Armington shifters so if you would implement this in GAMS, um, you would probably use iceberg trade costs to actually calibrate your whole model. Um, but if you have iceberg trade costs, you don't need the technology parameters anymore because basically with iceberg trade costs, which are shifters like Armington shifters, you can already uh, calibrate, your, calibrate your whole model. Yeah, so there is actually a different strand of literature um, uh, which kind of, well, well, which is also new quantitative trade models. It's the models in, in the spirit of Alvarez and Lucas and uh, Di Giovanni and Levchenko, for example, they use this kind of approach. They don't use calibration to, um, to actual values. And so they actually explicitly estimate technology parameters. Now, I think this can lead to accidents because it can lead to baseline values that are very different from actual values. But that is that is a different point. Um, so then if we want... Yeah, I, I know. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't need so much anymore. Um, so if we want to implement this in the, in the, in the GTAP model, um, then most of the changes, they are related to the fact that bilateral... Uh, sectoral prices do not vary by origin in the Eaton Corton model. That was his second property, that basically the uh, average price uh, of stuff that I import from each of the countries is, is the same. Yeah, and so that leads to all kinds of compli complications because on the one hand, you still need to keep track of costs of buying goods from, from a certain country because the price index is determined by the costs. But then, on the other hand, the price of uh, uh, um, the price of stuff that I uh, that I buy um, 
is going to be the same regardless of where I buy from. And that means that the tax equations, in the tax equations, you will need to work with this uniform price. Um, so that means that we need to make five, well, this is more JAMPAC related. We need to make five sets of changes. The update statements, uh, they need to change the trade elasticities. I will say something about this. Then import demand and price in this says the goods market equilibrium condition becomes much more complicated because we have this, this feature of this equal landed prices. And then also the expressions for tax revenues become more complicated. Yeah, so um, uh, let me skip this. So let me only discuss this. So the trade elasticities, what we decided to do in our exposition, and I think that is the correct thing to do. We decided in the comparison of Armington and Eaton Cortum, we decide to calibrate to the same trade elasticity. So that means that you estimate a gravity equation, you include uh, tariffs as we, uh, as we have here, and then the coefficient on tariffs. Basically, this is like export, uh, this is import tariffs, this is export taxes. Uh, that coefficient is all gonna be theta. And in an, Eton, in an Armington model, that would be sigma minus one. Yeah, and so given that theta is equal to sigma minus one, that means that if you want to compare the two things, you should set theta equal to sigma minus one. The other thing that you, um, uh, let me see, that comes here in the simulation design. So I, I the, the other implementation issues you can read in the paper. Uh, the other thing that we need to do if we want to make the models comparable is that we need to uh, uh, work with a collapsed straight structure uh, where E sub D is equal to E sub M. Um, and then we set theta equal to E sub N minus one so that we have basically the same trade elasticity. Yeah, so that is what we uh, uh, do when we, so now I jump to the, to the simulation design. So we run some simple counterfactual experiments in a version aggregated to 10 regions, 10 sectors and five factors of production. So we do global tariff liberalization, global cut in iceberg trade costs, export tax liberalization to see if the model works well. And finally, to get insights on this, um, uh, on these terms of trade effects, we do some unilateral tariff increases. Yeah, and then finally, because the model becomes much more nonlinear because of this, this price, this equal landed price feature, we need to solve the model with a lot of steps um, to make sure that Walras slack becomes marginal. Yeah, but basically what we see here is you could say why uh, do so much work um, for so little change? Well, I mean, that sometimes you could ask yourself that question because here we see the changes, the projected changes in real income under these four experiments for each of the 10 regions. And we see that the blue Armington and the orange Eaton Corton bars are very close to each other. Yeah, so when it comes to trade effects, if we look at the impact on trade volumes, we see that the impact in the Eaton Corton model tends to be smaller in each of these experiments. And the reason is basically, um, that we calibrate uh, uh, Eaton Cortum and Armington to the same trade elasticity, which is the elasticity of the value of trade uh, with respect to the trade costs. Whereas um, in Armington, the elasticity of the volume of trade with respect to trade costs is going to be E sub M and not E sub M minus one. Whereas in the Eaton Cortum model, also the elasticity of the volume of trade with respect to trade costs is theta. And the reason is, again, this uh, landed price, the fact that the landed price is equal uh, by country of origin. Yeah, and therefore, if you move from volume to, uh, from value to volume of trade, you're not gonna see any shift. Okay, then um, real GDP effects are somewhat different, but let me go to the, uh, to the last thing that is more, uh, intuitive, uh, the terms of trade effects. So the hypothesis uh, would be uh, that the terms of trade gains of um, increasing tariffs would be larger in an Eaton Cortum specification because you're able to uh, better drive down the prices of your trading partners. Yeah, and why is that? Because basically your landed price stays 
uh, uh, stays constant. It's only affected by when tariffs increases, increase that the average price level is changing. And therefore, uh, because only because you only see an impact through the average price level, therefore you're going to have, uh, uh, you should expect um, um, uh, less of a change in your landed price. And therefore you should expect that you're better able to drive down the prices of your trading partners. The issue is that in a GE setting, um, if you Im uh, impose tariffs, um, it's going to raise the price in the importing country, also in the Eaton Corton model by less, but still that's the case. Um, and that is going to actually lead to a higher export price. And so um, um, that which will raise the terms of trade um, on the on the export side. Yeah, and so what we find is that uh, basically the, the result here in, in this picture, we see that on the import side, uh, changes in import prices are uh, larger or more positive in the Armington model than in the Eaton Corton model. But then also the changes in export prices, they are more favorable in the Armington model because you, you basically the, the import prices go up and therefore by, by a learner symmetry kind of effect, that means that also the, uh, the prices uh, of exports will go up. And as a result, we see that we, we cannot uniformly say across all countries um, that um, the terms of trade gains are larger in, in Eaton Cortum. Actually, we see that in a couple of countries, the terms of trade gains are larger in, uh, under an Armington structure than an Eaton Cortum structure. Um, okay, so I, I've discussed these three main results. So how could we... Uh, elaborate on, on what we've done in this paper. Um, um, we could basically do a, a more proper test of Eaton Corton versus Armington by looking at these uh, at these projections on the on the changes in prices and also on uh, volumes of trade. Um, and then what we could also do is we could use the EK model to uh, to run long run projections and see what kind of differences we will see. Um, especially because the, the projected changes in the volumes of trade are different under the two models. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Eddie, for, for giving us a, a perfect introduction to um, modeling Eaton Corton based trade in, in GTAP. Um, oops. We now open the, the floor to questions. If you have any questions, feel free to um, unmute yourself or um, type them in, in the chat box. Dominique, please. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, that was a great exposition. I, I, I learned a lot in the differences of, of these trade models. When, when I see the formulas from the Eaton, Corm, uh, Eaton Cordum formulation, it looks a lot like a multinomial logit, yeah. So, but yes. you you never mentioned that, and I don't know if it's mentioned in the literature or not. Yes, so I, I think um, I think the the handbook chapter by Head and Meyer on gravity estimation. I think they they discuss this that there is a, a a neat link between basically in reduced form between using multinomial logits or using Eaton Cortum or using Armington. Yes, yeah, I, I think that's that's exactly that's exactly the point. Um, maybe one more point that is interesting is that in uh, in models on uh, on land use, there is this this paper that I was discussing by Costino, Donaldson, and Smith, and also Guell and Laborde, where they use the same kind of probabilistic formulation based on Frechet to actually uh, to actually model the allocation of land to uh, to different crops, where they basically make the assumption that um, uh, um, you have a continuum of land, and then you can use the land for different types of crops, and then they they get the same kind of formulation. And um, yeah, so the people who use this, they claim that it's a more elegant way to proceed compared to uh, uh, compared to a CET, for example. Other questions? Other questions? 
Okay, so while we're we're waiting for questions, I have um, two questions for you, Eddie. Um, one is, um, I think you you mentioned earlier about international transport margins. Um, perhaps you could elaborate more on what role it plays um, between the GTAP based um, trade model and the Eton Cortum um, based trade of GTAP. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, I think that becomes um, kind of tricky. But um, the thing is that, um, yeah, if, if you want to do... So basically in the Eaton Cortum model, if you want to solve this, you um, you assume that the, the landed price is the same regardless of the country of origin. Uh, and that means that if you go back to the, to the uh, tariff exclusive price and then actually to the, to the price, uh, to the FOB price, um, that you need to start from this landed price and then you subtract um, uh, you subtract first the tariff and then you subtract the, the, the transportation margin. And in, in that kind of operation, I think things or basically things things start to become different um, under under the Eton Cortum structure compared to the um, compared to the Armington structure. Uh, but we we haven't tested whether what happens when you when you get rid of the um, when you get rid of the uh, of the transportation uh, margins whether we would get then exact exact equivalence in terms of uh, in terms of changes in real income. Maybe one more thing that is important to mention is that this ACR result is really about the impact on real income. Yeah, so that's that's about that the two are equivalent when we look at real income effects in, in models where we have like a fixed trade balance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, so that, but that doesn't mean then that the, the, the trade changes in the volumes of trade or for example, real GDP are gonna be the same in the two structures. So your, your second question. Oh, okay. So my, my second question is, so after all the, the complexities and, and the effort of going through um, changing the, the model specification. So let's say you don't want um, to go through that um, and you just want to use the standard GTAP model, which most people are familiar with. Would it be enough to just change the, the to collapse the trade elasticities and um, do an E of M minus one and then you basically get very similar results to, to the EK model? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. If if you communicate, if you talk with NQT people, then you could, you could say, okay, look, I have collapsed indeed uh, the 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 Armington nest. Um, maybe you say, okay, I've used Caliendo Paro trade elasticities, um, and uh, I fixed the trade balance, and now my model is 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 pretty similar to uh, to your model. And I think also in the NQT community now. Uh, the 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 view of CGE models has has changed has quite changed quite substantially. If if you send a paper to a journal, you should still encounter that they that they will start asking questions about about that funny structure for for savings, for example, or the fact that you have savings and investment at all. So these NQT models, what they typically do is they put investment. They have one final demand which they typically, well, they just call it final demand or consumption, and they include investment there. And then they tend not to work with, with capital. Um, and so the argument is that, actually I've encountered this myself, the argument is that your model is cleaner and that with capital uh, and an investment, you have moving parts that could affect, uh, that could affect the simulation results. Um, Yes, yeah, so if you want to go full swing and 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 say, okay, I have a model which is strictly spoken, not Eaton Cortum, but is in reduced form, is is almost equivalent. Um, then then you would need to strip out some other features from the model. Thanks, Andy. Marta. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank thank you, Eddie, for a great presentation. Super interesting. And I have a very basic question. Ex explicitly on the extensive margin and like on some um, test experiments that you might be maybe thinking about doing. So 
in my maybe limited understanding, like one of the big differences between like what we do uh, in like the GDAP framework and the Eton Cortum is exactly this extensive margin, right? And like, do you think it's worth or were you thinking about like designing some experiments to run the horse race between those two models to test exactly the role of, of that? I mean, you know, we work in like, I work in the Department for Business and Trade. I mean, we will look at trade liberalization and like, this is quite important for us. So that's that's the context I'm asking for. Yes, so so I think when it comes to the extensive margin, um, let me, let me see how I put that. I I think it's not very very, and we have actually used this argument to to defend. So I'm I'm actually guilty myself, but I think the people who defend Eaton Cortum, based on the argument that it's better able to deal with an extensive margin. I'm not sure how valid this is, because basically you have what you're doing. You're, you're having an Eaton Cortum structure within each sector, but then uh, you have a continuum of goods. And so basically under Eaton Cortum, uh, each country within a certain sector is going to sell at least some goods within each of the sectors. Um, and so, of course, you could say no, but... Um, that continuum of goods that mimic basically it's mimicking say the HS10 lines within a sector, and then then you could say okay some countries um, they are not selling uh, certain varieties of basically the HS10 varieties, um, uh, and because they're sold by other countries, I think that's a defense by which you could say okay I'm I'm going after my extensive margin in in Eton Cortum. Um, um, but then, like when it comes to a horse race, um, I, I think the horse race is that is this is this feature of Eton Cortum that the the price is the same regard at the sector level. The price is the same regardless of the country of origin, and and the question is whether you, yeah, whether you think that that is that is realistic. So that is something that one could test. Um, because and the reasoning is then that say within steel uh, you have a whole bunch of HS10 lines, and then some countries are not selling uh, in certain HS10 lines because they are not competitive enough. I think you you could start to play with that. So maybe not even test like the this this price feature, which is very extreme, but you could start checking. Okay, countries that have higher prices at the HS10 level are they less likely to actually export export these goods? Um, yeah, but but I I think yeah it, it requires more thinking, um, and I think the alternative for going after the extensive margin is like is say uh, is is a is a Krugman structure or is a is a Mallet structure, um, although that also also comes with with problems because the Mallet structure where you really can do the extensive margin is this uh, I maybe you know you yeah, probably you know this this Helpman Mallet Rubenstein where you where you basically you don't have a proper well you do have a Pareto distribution but it's kept at the top and so therefore you cannot solve the integrals so it's it's I think the extensive margin is kind of really is, is also in the in the new quantitative trade I haven't seen li literature where people can really can really bring this to a quantitative model yeah the Helpman Mallets Rubenstein yeah they they claim I mean they go after the, the extensive margin, but then they cannot bring it to a multi-sector, multi-country setting, I think. Thank you, Eddie. Dominique? Yeah, the, um, while listening to your, your, your discussion of Eaton Court, and it seems to me it's all a supply side argument, all has to do with productivity, et cetera. Yeah, how does it jive with, with kind of the love of variety story, which is a different story? So. You, you mentioned steel, but let me mention automobiles. I mean, let's just assume that Toyota and Volkswagen have the exact same productivity, but you know, people people have different preferences for those two. Yes, um, yeah. So I, I think the defense that Eaton Cortum would bring then is is that they would say, okay, we still have this CES utility function. Um, so in in structural form of the model. We have a whole variety of of basically of different uh, of different brands in this case, like in the car industry. But then, because of this this probabilistic formulation, if you go to the reduced form, 
in the whole steel industry, then what is going to drive the, the basically the response of, of um, uh, uh, trade values to trade costs is going to be the heterogeneity of, of productivity. And uh, um, that is indifferent from, from, say, from Armington or also from Krupman, where let's take Krupman, where in Krupman it's really driven by how important people uh, think it is to, to consume all different varieties and how strong their love of variety is. Yeah. But, but I guess the defense that Eaton Corton would bring is that they start in the beginning in structural form. They start from a, from a, from a, from a continuum of varieties with a, with a conventional CES. I, I don't know if that answers the question. Luca, you want to follow up? Yes, uh, actually, thanks, uh, Eddie. This was a very clear presentation. But following up on the demand side, I understand that the parameter, the link between uh, Sigma in Armington and Theta, but why do you also need to collapse the two nests of the demand structure? Why wouldn't be consistent in the Eaton Corton framework? Um, yeah, I think I think if you don't collapse, then you would kind of stick an Armington structure between domestic and imported goods, you would stick it on top of an Eaton Cortum structure or the other way around. And I haven't thought that through. I think with Eaton Cortum, I think that becomes, I think that becomes uh, difficult to justify because basically, um, um, I mean, it, it would become very artificial. It would, it would say that on the one hand, when you decide between domestic and imported goods, you have uh, you you decide based on on where goods are coming from, but then when it comes uh, to uh, to imported goods, so all my imported goods, you have this CES structure, and then on, on basically you have the CES demand between a continuum of varieties, and on top of that, you're going to get this this probabilistic formulation. Um, I think it's a bit the same kind of critique to this. Uh, what is it? This paper by Finstra and. What are Finstra Romalis and the two more co-authors, where they stick a mallet structure on top of a of an Armington structure? Um, that that one also looks yeah looks looks somewhat complicated um, because basically you're you're combining two structures that on on I would say are are difficult to combine. Thanks. Okay, we are right on time. Well, um, let's. Now close the webinar and um, thank you everyone for, for this very fruitful discussion. And please join me in thanking Eddie um, for this wonderful presentation. Um, give him a virtual clap of hands if, if you can. And um, thank you so much to, to everyone for, for joining us. Um, just as a last plug for us, you can read Eddie's presentation by um, going to the Journal of Global Economic Analysis. It's the latest paper, um, or it's a, the first paper in the latest publication of, of JGEA. Um, and also please be on the lookout for, for the next webinar um, that we will be hosting um, in the next few months or so. All right, well, have a good day, afternoon, and evening, especially for, for those, for our colleagues in Asia. Um, thank you so much, and see you again in the next webinar.